Good morning and welcome to week five of our Roman series. And if we were on the golf course, uh, this would be the back nine, the start of the back nine. We're on the second leg, including today we have four more weeks to go. So there's still plenty of ancient wisdom for us to unpack, for us to excavate and discover together. As we've been seeing over the past four weeks is there's plenty here in this letter that Paul writes that speaks to us in our present situation. And over the next four weeks, we're going to keep going uh, because there is so much wisdom here, so much for us to sit with, to discover, to apply to the current situation, uh, the current circumstances that we find ourselves in right here, right now. I mean, this, as we've been saying, this is truth that transcends. Uh, this is truth that doesn't go out of style. It's enduring. It's endless. And today, I want to talk about another one of the big ideas, another big theme that Paul weaves throughout this entire letter to the Christians living in Rome. And it's the topic, or it's the idea of God's enduring faithfulness. And for me, when I was putting this one together, I mean, this is an idea, ooh, it gets you. I mean, this for me is such a, a compelling, motivating, such a transforming idea for me in my life. And in order to talk about the faithfulness of God, Paul takes us all the way back to the beginning of the story because he wants to show how this tradition that these Christ followers are swimming in that they find themselves immersed in, it's a tradition that many others have been walking before them. Uh, this isn't a new path. This is a path that has, man, I mean, people have been walking this path for thousands of years before Paul wrote this letter, and obviously for uh, thousands of years after Paul wrote this letter. This is the tradition that we find ourselves immersed in. So Paul takes his readers back to the beginning of the story. Now, uh, as we dive into this this morning, one question uh, that, that gets raised is, why is the faithfulness of God such a big idea? Why does Paul make such a big deal out of it? And again, as we've been seeing, everything that Paul writes is very, very specific to his audience. There's a reason why he's writing. Uh, there's a certain uh, chain of events that have occurred. There, there are certain, uh, there's a certain crisis that his readers are facing. And obviously, this is wisdom that we can glean for us in our lives, but he is writing to a specific audience for a very specific reason. And last week, we talked about, uh, in 49 Common Era, the Jewish population, or at least a portion of the Jewish population, was expelled. They were kicked out of Rome. Emperor Claudius said, you must all leave. There were certain disturbances associated with the Jewish population because of someone named Crestus. And Claudius said, enough, I've had it. Uh, we don't need any more turmoil here. The trouble that you're causing, we don't need you here in our city. So you must leave. Now, right before Paul writes this letter uh, of Romans, the Jewish population starts stumbling back into Rome. They return. They were exiled. Now they're returning back to Rome. But I mean, think about the shame that they would have been carrying around with them. Think about the looks from everyone else. Sure, they were allowed back in because of Nero's benevolence, but think about how the common folk, people like you and me, would have viewed this group of people. They had been kicked out, and now they're staggering home. They're weary. I mean, these are people that you look at them and you think, man, they are at the bottom low status, low social class. I mean, the Jewish population was not looked upon favorably at all uh, within the Roman Empire, specifically in Rome. So if you're part of this Jewish population, you have a tradition that goes all the way back to your forefather, Abraham. These questions about, well, is God still with us? Is God still faithful to us? I mean, these are questions that would have been raised for hundreds, thousands of years, every single time that they were conquered by another nation. But obviously, 
these questions are fresh. The wounds this time, they're raw. Because they're at the bottom and they know the looks. And they're beginning to ask, are we being punished for something that, that we have done? Is God against us? Is God no longer for us? So you have all these questions that are lingering in the air amongst the Jewish population. And then, uh, as we said, the part of the audience of this letter would have been the non-Jewish or the Gentile Christ followers. And when they see the Jewish population returning, and this goes back to where we were last week, there were high levels of arrogance, of moral superiority, of believing they were in the right, in the sense, believing that they had replaced the Jewish people as God's favored or chosen people. So they're boasting, they're arrogant, they consider themselves the replacement of those who came before. They are now God's favored people. So you have two groups, some groups wondering, has God abandoned us? And then another group claiming superiority over another group. And what was Paul's response to all these questions, to all of these thoughts? Paul's response is, no. No, that's not how it works. I mean, think about the world that we live in today. One of the questions that often gets raised in our culture is, why do bad things happen to good people? The question the Jewish nation, the Jewish people would have been asking 2,000 years ago is, why have bad things been allowed to happen to God's people? I mean, you ever ask that question yourself? Why am I going through this? Why am I suffering through this period of life? Why did this happen to me? Has God completely abandoned me? And then, and then why is it that those who don't seem to be suffering, who don't seem to be having any hardships, you know, they don't always seem like they're following in line with the life that God desires. So all of these questions, they're modern questions, but they're ancient questions as well. And Paul just I mean, he emphatically states, yeah, I understand that's how it looks, but that's not the whole truth. Almost as if uh, he, he's saying there, is, there are other forces at work in the world that you can't see. On the surface, this is how things appear, but under the surface, there are other things that are happening. And in order to uh, give a little more meat to his no, in order to explain his no a bit, he goes into this entire story about Abraham. So let's pick it up in Romans chapter 3. Uh, we'll be in verse, well here's verse 27, continuing the theme from last week. Where then is boasting? Again, remember we said last week, arrogance, boasting, judging, common theme, and he picks up on that. And then he asks verse 29, is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? He's provoking them. Is God only the God of the Jews? I mean, is he only the God of the Gentiles? Obviously the answer is no, uh, but Paul is beginning to, he's provoking. He's asking questions because he wants them to think about the implications of what it is that they're saying. And he answers himself. He says, yes, God is the God of Gentiles too. God is a universal God. God is a God who is for everyone. I mean, this is a very Jewish idea. It goes back to uh, one of their most common prayers, the Shema. God is one. There is one universal God for all of us. God of these people, these people, these people, and these people. There is one family. Uh, verse 30, since there is only one God, there we go, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith. We talked a bit about this last week. There were certain traditions that people were following, and Abraham saying, or Paul is saying, it's all included. Some people follow this tradition. Some people follow this tradition. Some people uh, have these laws and regulations. Other people don't follow those laws and regulations. And there's room for everyone. 
I mean, do you see how mind-blowing this would have been? How evolutionary this would have been for uh, people's understanding of the divine. There's not a God here for these people, and then another one over in this nation for these people. There's actually a God that transcends all. And then uh, verse uh, or chapter 4, he goes on, and unfortunately there's, there's a break here. Uh, there, there's a new header, but this whole idea, starting from way back all the way through into verse 4, should be seen as one idea. One of the problems with the modern translations that we read is we have translators who decide to break up the Bible into different chapters and people who put different subheadings and, and different points, but that subheading should be removed because we should see all of this as one idea. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. When someone works, you expect to get a paycheck. At the end of the week, for the work that you've done, you expect your boss, the company that you work for, to provide a paycheck for you. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. A couple things going on here. First, uh, we mentioned universal God. Is God for the Jews? Is there a God for the Gentiles? No. There's one God for all. Second, Paul is talking about this common heritage that is shared between the Jewish population and the Gentile, the non-Jewish population. There's one family. We have the same founding father. It's not George Washington. It's Abraham. Abraham, yes, forefather for the Jewish people, but also he is our forefather as well. Father Abraham had many sons. I am one of them, and so are you. Our family tree, our family trees, they're all linked. We're all part of the same family. Unfortunately, what religion typically does is it, it separates, and it says you have this family, you have this family, you have this family. Abraham is just blowing all that away, transcending all of it, and saying, hey, we have a common heritage. Here's the tradition that all of us are swimming in. This is the tradition that Paul desires for all of us to shape our lives around. Whether you are a blood relative of Abraham, or if you're a non-blood relative of Abraham, like the Gentiles, Paul's saying, we're all related. And this is the idea of adoption, being adopted into this universal family that God has been building and forming and shaping from all the way back early on in the story. Uh, and then another idea that's found in these couple of verses, this tradition that Paul is picking up on, the tradition that Paul is living in, that he is inviting these Roman Christians, or he's telling them, this is the tradition you're a part of. It's a tradition of gift, of grace. This tradition of gift and grace, it opposes the Roman story, the Roman tradition. The Jewish people, they had their founding story with Abraham. The Roman people, they had their own founding story. And it was a completely different story. The foundation of Rome, I mean, you could say it's like the complete opposite of the foundation that Paul is building on. The Roman tradition is one of taking and seizing. It's one of forcefully working your way for the things that you desire, the things that you want. It's one of gripping and clawing. It's one of violence. In the Roman tradition, there are winners and there are losers. And what Paul is doing, he's combating that Roman tradition. Because for many people, the Jewish population, they were seen as the losers. They had been exiled. Paul is turning all that upside down and saying, there's no hierarchy in God's family. There's no winners and losers. There's only winners. Because the whole thing is all about gift. And if it's all about grace, if it's all about gift, 
How could there possibly be winners and losers? How could there possibly be people who have more of that gift than others? I mean, do you see how revolutionary these words of Paul are for the world at that time? Do you see how revolutionary these words are for us in our world today? I mean, we are shaped by the Roman tradition, by the tradition of winners and losers and seizing and having to take through our own power, our own might, the things that we want, the things that we desire in life. Our world, it's not shaped by grace. It's shaped in the Roman tradition of force. And then within the Roman tradition, there was an economy of merit. There were, uh, there was a tradition of benefaction, which means that you wanted to please people who were above you. So you would give them gifts. If you wanted to please the Caesar, you would offer him sacrifices. You would put on games in his honor. And you did all of this because you wanted his favor. So you did something in order to receive someone's favor. You gave something so that you could have something in return. This is the very opposite of gift. Paul is saying in God's economy, in the tradition that you're to be rooted in. It's not about earning favor. It's not about working your way into favor, but rather this is a tradition that has been about gift from the beginning. I know oftentimes the book of Romans is seen as Paul is saying the Jewish, the Jewish faith is one of earning and the Christian faith is one of grace. No, no, not true here. What we see Paul isn't, he's not speaking against the Jewish faith. He's not speaking against the Jewish tradition. He's speaking out against the Roman way of being in the world. He's actually saying the Jewish faith has been about grace from the beginning. Just look at the story of Abraham. He received something that he didn't earn. Something, as Paul says, that he didn't work for. I mean, man, imagine if our world, imagine if our religion, the Christian faith, man, imagine if we lived each moment in a state of grace, seeing everything we've been given as a gift. Uh, Paul uses this phrase, credited to him, God credited to him as righteousness. Now, this brings us all the way back. Remember I said he's going all the way back to the beginning of the story. This phrase brings us all the way back to the beginning of God's story with the Jewish nation. The moment when God cut a covenant with Abraham. If we flip all the way back in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 15, we come to the moment when God made a covenant, a pact with Abraham. And this would have been a very common practice in the ancient world. You made a covenant with someone as a way to say, you're going to uphold your end of the bargain, I'm going to uphold my end of the bargain. So a very common practice at the time, and God says, I'm going to make a promise to you. And let's make a covenant as a way for us to each say, we're going to hold up our end of the bargain, our end of the deal. I mean, just think about it. If you go and you buy a car, what's going to happen is the car dealership is going to say, you give us this amount of money, this is your end of the bargain, and then we will be faithful to you and we will give you the car that your money is purchasing. So your end of the bargain is money, our end is car. So this whole idea, this whole barter system, this whole idea of giving in order to receive, I mean this goes way, way, way back to the ancient world. And a covenant, signing, I mean think about uh, an agreement, a contract, a lease, you sign your name as a way to say, yes, I am going to do the thing that I am promising to do. So in verse 15, there's a vision. Now, verse 1, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. And he tells him, you're, you're going you're gonna to have a son through, through your wife. Uh, verse 5, in this vision, he took him outside, God took him outside and said to Abraham, or he's Abram at this time, his name hasn't been changed yet, look up at the heavens and count the stars if indeed you can count them. <laughs> I love that. Count the stars, if you actually think you can. 
you think you can count the stars, your descendants, your family, it's going to be as numerous as the star. You're not going to even be able to count all of your descendants. It's going to be this universal family. Uh, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. I mean, here's this promise. God's saying, I promise to make you the father of many nations. Verse 6, Abram believed the Lord and God credited it to him as righteousness. There's that phrase, credited it to him as righteousness. Uh, and then verse 8, I love this part. It says, Abram believed, God credited it to him, and then verse 8. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? Talking about this land that God's going to give him. So there's, there's belief, but there's also question. There's some doubt. I mean, right from the beginning of the tradition, we find this history of questioning the divine, of doubting at times. It's all part of our faith. There's moments of belief, and then there are moments of question, moments in which we doubt. It's part of it. It goes back to the beginning of the story. Uh, and then here we are with the covenant. Verse 9, and this is right after Abram had asked God, how will I know that I'm going to take possession of this land that you are promising me? And the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. So here's how the covenant would have occurred. So Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. So all the animals that he brought, he cut them in half, and then he put them on opposite sides of a path. Because whenever there's a covenant, what you would do is you would walk in the middle of the halves. So you would put, what's, what's one of the things? A heifer. You cut the heifer in half, you put one half on the left side, one half on the right side, and then the first person would walk through this path, and there are about four animals here. The first person would walk through the path, and then the second person, this is like signing your name. And what it basically said is, if I don't uphold my end of the bargain of the covenant, make me like these animals. Split me in half. I mean, talking about uh, being a person of your word, what you're saying is, hey, if I'm not a person of my word, may you cut me in half also. These are how covenants were, were carried out in the ancient world. Listen to what happens with this covenant. Verse 12. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Okay, he hasn't walked through this path yet, and yet he's fallen asleep. He had too much turkey. Uh, Thanksgiving meal. He fell asleep. How is he going to walk through this path? How is he going to cut the covenant? How is he going to declare to God, I will be faithful to you. I will uphold my end of the bargain. And then it continues, and, and God uh, recounts the promise. He tells him all about this promise. You're going to have descendants. You're going to have this land. Then it says, verse 17, when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed through the pieces. This was God's presence, passing through the pieces walking through the path. And then verse 18, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Notice, who walked through these pieces? God. And only God. Abram was passed out asleep. Essentially, what's being said here, what we discover in Genesis 15, back in the beginning of the story, the covenant, the promise, the tradition that we're a part of, it's never been about our faithfulness. It's been about the faithfulness of God right from the start. It's always been about God always been about grace, about gift. It's never been about our performance. It's never been about 
us working our way to receive something, earning something through the things that we do, our actions, being morally right all the time, thinking all the right things. It's a tradition that's birthed in grace. It's always been about God's faithfulness. I mean, what, what's happening here, it's almost like God's like, all right, yeah, I know there are going to be moments when you're unfaithful. I know there are going to be moments when you lose the plot, when you walk off the path. It's okay. It's okay. It's not about you getting everything right all the time. But I promise to be faithful to you no matter what. And anyone need to hear that this morning? You know, as a pastor, I, I'm often, I often come across people who have these haunting questions about the divine. There are things that haven't gone the way in which they expected, the way in which they desire for them to go in life. They come upon hard times. And the questions that are asked, I mean, these are questions can be so damaging to our soul. Is God still for me? Is God still with me? Am I being punished for something that I did? Have I strayed too far off the path? That one thing that I did six years ago that I just can't get out of my memory, is it because of that that I'm going through this? Has God left me? Has God abandoned me? Will I be eternally damned because of this? Or that. I mean, these are soul-crushing questions. But if we're being honest, they're questions that come up for many of us again and again. For some of us, these are questions that have been shaped by the tradition that we grew up in. A tradition that instead of promoting gift promotes a system of guilt and guilts you into a particular path. I mean, I'm asked these questions by people way too frequently. I mean, these are some of the questions that are being asked by the people that Paul is writing to about themselves, but also about other people. And Paul's saying, no, no. I, I understand they've gone off the path. You've traveled off the path. I, I understand all of that, but the story has always been about the faithfulness of God to you in spite of where you've been. I mean, despite wherever your feet have taken you, God is still faithful to you. I mean, here's Paul, Romans 3. Remember I said this is a theme all throughout the letter. 3 verse, verse 3. What if some did not have faith? Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every man a liar. Will my faithlessness, will my lack of faith, will their lack of faith, will it nullify God's faithfulness to us, to me? No. Even in your lack of faith, even in the moments when you don't, you can't muster up the faith, you, you can't muster up the faith to believe, to have hope, God is still faithful to you. God is still with you. In the uh, late 1800s, there is a poem that was written by an English poet by the name of Francis Thompson. He wrote this poem, or first appeared in 1893, called The Hound of Heaven. And Thompson, he was a Roman Catholic. He had wanted to be a priest, and then he abandoned that path. He was stricken by poverty, and then he, he became addicted to opium. And he struggled with this addiction for many, many years. And it was during this addiction that, that he wrote this poem called The Hound of Heaven. And you can find it online. It's, I think it's a 182-line it's a poem all about 
this idea of God's faithfulness. Now you can go and read this, but the, the poem is written in in some in old English, so it's, you really have to sit with it a while. It's hard to unpack, and some of the words you're like, wait, what does this mean? And it's hard to understand it. There's been a couple uh, modern translations of it that you can find online as well. But I want to read for you uh, how someone describes this poem. Talking about the name of the poem itself. The name is strange. It startles one at first. It is so bold, so new, so fearless. It does not attract, rather the reverse. But when one reads the poem, this strangeness disappears. The meaning is understood. If you can decipher the old English. <laughs> some of it I can, some of it I'm like, wait, what is he saying? As the hound follows the hare, never ceasing in its running, ever drawing nearer in the chase, with unhurrying, an unperturbed pace, so does God follow the fleeing soul by his divine grace. God's not in a hurry, but God is right there walking with us, pursuing us wherever our feet are walking. Uh, the description continues, And though in sin or in human love, away from God it seeks to hide itself, divine grace follows after. Till the soul feels its pressure, forcing it to turn to him alone in that never-ending pursuit. Wherever we go, whether we are consciously or unconsciously running away, divine grace is right there with us, following us, pursuing us, melting our hearts with love. I'll just read. Here, here's the first couple of lines. I fled him. Talking about the hound of heaven, this divine grace. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinth ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him in under running laughter. From those strong feet that followed, followed after, but with unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy. I fled him and yet I couldn't escape the faithfulness of God. I mean, I love this. Romans 8, verse 38. Here's Paul. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. For Paul, Jesus was the culmination of this promise made to Abraham thousands of years ago. Paul was saying, hey, in Jesus, we see God's enduring faithfulness. And in the person of Jesus, we see grace we see love that is for all of us. God is building a universal family. It's not about earning. It's not about merit. It's not about gaining favor. It's one of simply receiving. It's one of gift. It's one of grace. And Paul's come to believe in his life and from what he's seen of other people no matter what he himself has gone through, no matter what others have gone through, no matter where you find yourself this morning, if you find yourself in a place lacking faith, if you find yourself in a place of guilt, maybe you're in a place of questioning, wondering, is it okay for me to walk this path? I know my tradition says this, but I'm beginning to walk a bit of a different path. Now, maybe you find yourself haunted by shame. You feel like there's a gap, a chasm between you and the divine. Paul's saying there is nothing in this world. There's nothing in death. I mean, think about Jesus, resurrection. I mean, this is the power 
of God. This is the hound of heaven that chases us in moments of life, but that continues chasing us through death as well. So this week, may you come to see the hound of heaven, the divine grace that has always been with you. May you come to trust, to believe, to see that God is endlessly faithful to you. If there is any guilt, any shame, may it dissipate. May it leave. And may you be overwhelmed by the love and the grace of this God as seen in the person of Jesus. May you come to trust that this God is for you and always will be for you, no matter where your feet may walk. And may this grace shape your life. May it transform you. May you find a freedom and a life as you embrace and live in this story. Go in the grace and peace of Jesus this week. Amen.